Okay, I'd like to go ahead and start this meeting of the Legislative Oversight Committee for Improvement and Assessment and Education. Uh, this will be the second meeting we've had this fall. We had the first meeting in September, and now we have the second here in January. Um, I do have a, and we are being streamed for the public that's out there, knowing that we are being streamed right now. So uh, in the future, too, we're going to try to get for these smaller subcommittee meetings. Uh, Representative Cornell, did you get a copy of the agenda there? That's it, yes. Uh, we are going to try to have a smaller subcommittee or committee, our standing committee like this, statutory committee, uh, sit around the tables in the center here so we'd be a little closer to the public and so that it's, it's more of like a work group. Uh, although we do make recommendations and will make recommendations. Um, in looking at the agenda, there are copies on the table over there. There's the one sheet and then there's a couple packets with everything that we're going to be looking at today. Um, to begin with, I'd like to introduce the people that are on this committee. To my far right, your left, we have Representative Cornell. She's been on this committee. She's on her second committee, I think, this week. Yes. Yesterday it was Career Tech Education, and, and today this, and then tomorrow another, and the day after that another. It's a, it's a busy schedule. And then we have Representative Luno, who is a member of this committee. Um, and Representative Luno, of course, has been here on education for years and, and is very knowledgeable of this area that we're talking about. Next beside him, we have Representative Myler, who is a past chair of House Education and is the ranking uh, uh, representative. Um, and he is here today not as a member of this committee. He's just sitting in and, and listening to what we're doing and may participate, but he's not a voting member on this particular uh, committee. And then we have Representative uh, Cordelli. Representative Cordelli is the vice chair of, of this uh, 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 of the education committee and has also been on education for a number of years. Myself, Rick Ladd from Haverhill. And to my left, we have Senator Ruth Ward. Senator Ward is chair of the Senate Education uh, Committee and on numerous other committees as well. It's uh, as a senator, you are, you know, obligated to sometimes two, three, I don't know how many committees, standing committees, but uh, it's quite a task. We appreciate her having the time today to come to this particular meeting. She is a voting member on this committee. To start out on our agenda here so we don't waste any time, I just put as number one, and I want to refresh everybody as far as what are the duties of the Legislative Oversight Committee. This is a committee that was reinstated in the last year. It had been eliminated However, this committee has some very important tasks, and reading through them, I'll do it very quickly. These are summarized. These are not specifically how it's stated in statute. The Legislative Committee shall review the development and implementation of school performance and accountability program. So that's, that's quite a task in itself. Submit an annual report. That report submitted to the, the Senate, to the House, to the State Librarian, um, etc. Uh, C, proposed legislation that is needed as a result of the review of the progress and results of the policies implemented under this chapter. So we are responsible for sub uh, submitting any new legislation that we see as necessary or needed. D, confer with commissioner of the state board, uh, the commissioner and the state board of education to identify and support improved school performance and accountability. So we work closely with the department and with the state board. E, analyze existing Department of Education programs and initiatives which support improved school performance and accountability. That's right down our bailiwick right now that we have to be addressing how we're looking at improving where we are in our academic uh, programs and accountability for those programs. F, receive reports from the commissioner regarding the status of public education, updates on the improvement made by local school districts towards achieving satisfactory progress, and student performance. So we receive these reports back from the department. G, review and approve statewide performance targets developed by the Department of Education and recommend to the Legislative Oversight Committee uh, by the State Board of Education. So any kind of uh, changes in targets have to be recommended to this committee and receive this committee's approval. H, receive reports from the State Board of Education, including rules recommended by the department relative to statewide performance targets 
required under RSA 193H2 and proposed legislation to be submitted to establish such statewide performance targets and state statute during the legislative season session. Review the unique pupil identification system and propose areas within. So that's another area of dealing with confidentiality of student records and of personnel working here. Uh, review the implementation and results of the program relative to accountability for the opportunity for an adequate education established in 193E. So now we're involving ourselves in 193E, which is the adequacy section of education. And consult and receive reports on such program, evaluate and review existing and emergent performance-based measurement tools, and propose legislation for improvements to the accountability program as necessary. K receive security breach reports from the Department of Education pursuant to RSA 189 colon 66. Consult with the commissioner and propose legislation needed as a result of the review. So that's one area we really not have been involved with. I hope we aren't. I hope we have no security breaches, but in that case, this committee becomes involved. Review and make recommendations relating to academic standards and under consideration by the State Board of Education pursuant to 193E to a column four, parentheses C. So there's a huge task in itself that we review and approve these academic standards. Mm -hmm. So today what I've asked under number two here, I've met just recently several times with uh, Dr. Uh, Nate Green. Uh, Nate is working over at the Department of Education. Uh, he works downstairs in dealing with all this data and information and it's a, a data analysis and uh, we hopefully we can give them support this year with supporting aid and support through some of our legislation. But I asked him to come today and explain to where we are, at, try to define and speak to academic standards and the minimum standards for public school approval. There has been some, not some, I, you know, in the papers you, you hear of it, um, concerns regarding the, the process which is going on right now for the minimum standards for public school approval. Um, at this time, uh, Nate's going to just give us an update where we are and try to help us define the difference between these academic standards and the minimum public school standard, public standards for public school approval. M Mr. Chair? Yes. Could I, um, could I make a couple of comments before we start in with um, Dr. Green? Uh, if it's... No, no, just relevant to what you were just okay, talking about. Okay, go ahead. Yes. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Absolutely. So, so thanks very much, Rick, and, and uh, thanks everybody for, for joining us here this morning for our, our introductory meeting. I'm glad uh, the chair read through the, uh, the duties which are enumerated in the, uh, the statute that establishes this committee, but, uh, but I think it's also worth um, just r reminding the members of the committee and members of the public um, uh, some of the uh, some of the language from the preamble, which was the rationale behind behind establishing this committee, and specifically, and I'm just reading from parts B and C in the uh, in the preamble of the uh, of the statute uh, 193C8A, um, and uh, and it's it's very interesting, and I think it speaks a lot to um, to public schools in uh, in New Hampshire and 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 how we we go about doing things. But, but it, it reads like this. Respecting New Hampshire's long tradition of community involvement, appropriate means are established to provide an adequate, an adequate education through an integrated system of shared responsibility between state and local government. In this system, the state establishes minimum standards for public school approval and academic standards for delivery of educational services at the local level. School districts then have the responsibility and flexibility in implementing diverse educational approaches to instruction and curriculum tailored to meet student needs. And the next part um, concludes and very importantly, it says, um, uh, New Hampshire's long history of authorizing local governments in the form of local districts to develop and administer public schools pursuant to a set of minimum standards established by the state has successfully achieved, on average across the state, and that's an important thing, on average across the state, high quality educational outcomes. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. yeah if you open up your, your yellow uh, statutory books, which we have, the first statute there is dealing with the shared responsibility for education and lists all those that are sharing that responsibility. So going in here, I welcome Nate. Um, 
Could you please help us out with the academic standards and, and with the minimum standards for public school? school approval. Absolutely, yeah. So for the record, uh, my name is Dr. Nate Green. I'm with the New Hampshire Department of Education. Uh, currently, I'm the Bureau Administrator for the Bureau of Educational Opportunities, uh, which includes a variety of different offices. Um, one of those offices is the Office of Public Schools. Another one is uh, Assessment and Accountability. And much of the work that I'll talk about today uh, is involving both of those offices sort of simultaneously. There's a lot of overlap. Um, and I think because of that overlap, there's sometimes some inconsistencies and there's some conflation of what academic standards are and what the minimum standards are. And part of the problem is they both use the word standards. And oftentimes in education, we just talk about standards. And so part of what I want to do right off the bat is just make sure that there's a clear distinction between what we're talking about when we say academic standards and what we're talking about when we say the minimum standards for public school approval. So the minimum standards for public school approval are state regulations. They're found in uh, ED 306. And that full set of standards define the minimum requirements for a public school to be approved in the state of New Hampshire. And it includes a variety of different things, uh, things like nursing services, uh, food services, janitorial services, uh, the responsibilities of principals, teachers, as well as the responsibilities on districts when offering academic programs. And that's a key distinction that I want to point out is the minimum standards are relative to programs at the various school levels, elementary, middle, and high school. So they define what a mathematics program is required to do at a middle school level, for example, or at a high school level. Separate from the minimum standards, we have our academic standards. In New Hampshire, we call those the College and Career Ready Frameworks. They can be found on the Department of Education's website, and they are much, much more extensive documents. They are what we would you know, refer to as true academic standards. So for example, in science, New Hampshire adopted the next generation science standards. Those are the academic standards that define what a student should know and be able to do at every grade level, K through 12, in science. So if you're looking at a third grader in science, the next generation science standards are going to lay out a whole set of standards for what that third grader should be able to do by the end of that grade. Similarly in high school, if we're looking at something like chemistry, there's going to be a whole set of standards in the NGSS that lays out what a chemistry student should be able to do at the end of a chemistry course. And so that's, those are the, the differences between what the minimum standards are, which are relative to programs. So for example, in science, it might say that in a science classroom, you need to have a certain amount of laboratory space for student safety. Um, the districts need to offer a certain number of science courses. But actually identifying what a student should know and be able to do at a really granular level is outside of the minimum standards. And those are the academic standards that the state board has adopted. And where those come into play, separate from school approval, is that's what we use to build our state assessment framework. So right now we assess students in three core areas, uh, reading and ELA, math, and science. And our state assessments and those frameworks for the state assessments are built on the academic standards that we've adopted, not the minimum standards. And I think there's sometimes some conflation between those two things. Um, but those larger academic standards documents are the, the definitions of what students should know, that's what we build our definition of proficiency on, and that's what we test our students on through the state assessment system. So I'm going to stop there for a minute to see if there are any questions. Are there questions from the committee at this time on, on this point? So I will ask one then. Um, if I were to open up 306 and look at the area of art, which is at the, you know, it's a curricular area, substantive criteria of an adequate education, it mentions art. And then it talks about the elementary, middle, and high school uh, programs in terms of how art uh, is uh, defined or, or used. It does mention academic standards there. In, on, now, so the, the, the minimum standards for public school approval is, You've, you've mentioned a whole lot of elements or components which are above and beyond the act, you know, like, like the, the facility itself, like the, the libraries and all that. But we, we are talking about subject areas. And when we start dealing with the, this minimum uh, uh, standards for public uh, school approval, we are also then, aren't we also discussing academic standards? 
So there are parts of the minimum standards when you read them that they read like an academic standard. Yeah. Um, and some of them read a little bit like uh, competencies, which, you know, teachers are building competencies into their instruction when they build a curriculum for a particular course or a grade level. The difference is the granularity, I think. So if you take art as an example, the minimum standards, uh, it requires districts to offer art programs K through 12. And it talks about some of the things that they have to offer. They have to offer opportunities for students to become involved in uh, artistic expression, in dance, in theater, in music. What the minimum standards don't do is they don't say at a third grade level, students should be able to know and do X, Y, and Z in art. So it's that level of granularity that exists in the academic standards. So we have national art standards that many of our districts in the state use. Mm. We have art standards that we post on the Department of Education website. And those go really, really specifically into what should second grade art look like? What should third grade art? What should fourth grade? What are the types of skills that students need to be able to know and do? That level of detail is not in the minimum standards. The minimum standards are going to say you need to offer opportunities in dance. You need to offer opportunities in theater. You need to offer opportunities in um, drawing or painting, things like that. But what, how you actually build a curriculum, you need a lot more specificity and granularity to build a curriculum, to build out lessons, to have a progression throughout the school year. And much of that comes from the framework that's in the academic standards and not the minimum standards. Thank you. Yes, Representative Luna. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, and it's sort of a follow-up to um, to your question, Rick. And and thank you, Dr. Green, for um, you know discussing the 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 differences between minimum standards and academic standards. I, I appreciate um, the now having a better understanding of, uh, of of where those differences are. But um, could you talk? I mean, when you talked about minimum standards, you talk about you talked about programs. You talked about services like custodial services and and um, and what the opportunities, the programmatic opportunities, uh, a school uh, would uh, needs to offer its uh, its students. But I was wondering if you could sort of reflect on where the minimum standards um, talk about the. Um, um, you know what what I guess is expected or what are the outcomes that are expected from from a student's um, uh, perspective and um, and now that particularly as as students you know go into you know from elementary to a middle school to a um, to a um, uh, uh, you know, secondary school to to uh, graduation. Um, how do the minimum standards reflect on 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 things from a from a student's um, perspective? So it's interesting because there are places where you can pull out. I would say you could read into the standards to say, you know, these are going to be the expectations that we have on students and what the student outcomes should be and what we want. And I think ultimately in education, that's our goal, right? We have student outcomes as our final goal. We want all students to be proficient across the subjects that they're taking. We want them to be ready for colleges and careers when they leave our K-12 system. But the minimum standards themselves are a, a set of regulations that were written primarily with a audience of school boards and superintendents. And so when you read much of them, it says things like the school board shall, uh, the school board shall provide, or the school board shall ensure. And so they're more programmatic in nature, even though the programs we're putting into place through the minimum standards, we have certain expectations of what those student outcomes are going to be. They're really written from the perspective of this is what we're expecting the local school board to provide to their community or to their students, or this is what we expect a teacher to provide through the course of implementing a math program or through the course of implementing a science program. So I would say student outcomes are probably more reflected in statute when you look at things like RSA 193H, which is the accountability system. And that's where we talk about things like performance targets. That's where we set uh, short-term and long-term goals for student achievement on things like math and reading and ELA, sort of separate from the minimum standards. But the minimum standards really set out what is, what's the minimum academic and educational program that we want to offer our students that really reflects a high-quality education in New Hampshire. Thank you. So I'll follow up to that. Um, if I'm looking at 193H and I see the uh, titles of various things called performance standards for level one, level two, level three, level four. Um, so that performance standard, uh, let's say a one or any of them, is reflective of where on the spectrum 
for the academic standards in that subject area or that substance area of criteria area. Yeah, you know, see, they, they, to me, I, I'm, I see them overlapping somewhat here, and I, I don't know if I'm seeing it correctly or not. There's, so there's a little bit of an overlap, and I, and almost in the way of a, a hierarchical system. So the minimum standards as a document of study regulations tell a district you have to offer math, and you have to offer math K-12 every year. You know, at the high school level, students need to take four years of math. Here's a number of courses in math that they're required to have by the time they graduate. They need to reflect things like algebra and geometry. And then when teachers sit down or, or principals sit down or curriculum directors sit down and they start to build those programs, they're generally not going to the minimum standards because the minimum standards say, this is what you have to do. But now as you build that out, we have the academic standards over here that say, you know, in geometry, here are the you know, 25 or 30 concepts that students really should be able to understand, whether you know, we're looking at uh, shapes or proofs or uh, angles. You know, if, you, if you want to know about sine, cosine, and tangent within geometry, those words are not going to ever appear in the minimum standards. Yeah. But we know that that is a crucial part of learning geometry and understanding angles and shapes. Uh, and for the record, I'm not a geometry teacher, so if I try not to delve too far deeply into that particular thing. I was a chemistry teacher, so maybe I should use those as examples. Um, those academic standards are also what we build the state assessment on. So when we talk about proficiency, when we first uh, built the current state assessment that we're using now back in like 16, 17, we brought in groups of teachers at the different grade levels, and we had the teachers go through the standards, so not the minimum standards, but the academic standards, the college and career ready frameworks, and they actually took the assessment. They went through each of the questions, and then they sat down with uh, psychometricians, they sat down with researchers that were part of the assessment company that the state uses, and we determined what level of performance did students need to have on each of the various questions, and how many questions, and how, what kinds of answers do they have to provide in order for the student's performance to be reflective of those academic standards. And that's how we set the level one, two, three, and four. It was a pretty lengthy process that involved teachers at all those different grade levels throughout the state. So it's not something that's set for us by the assessment company. It's actually something that we build through uh, collaboration with teachers in the field that are teaching at each of those different grade levels. Um, but the minimum standards were not part of that piece of it. So proficiency and performance on the assessments comes from those academic standards mm -hmm. and mapping back to those standards, not necessarily to the minimum standards. Though the minimum standards do require that we have to teach math in our schools. Representative Cordelli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Dr. Green. Um, in addition, um, to the level one through four proficiency. Um, there are also state targets for proficiency. And am I correct in that those are defined as part of the um, ESSER state plan that is developed by the uh, department and um, stakeholders? Yes. Yeah, so one of the things that we're required to do as part of the ESSER state plan, we have to set um, annual uh, benchmark and targets um, statewide. And uh, we did that through a, um, I would say it's probably a, a little bit of a logistical regression process where we looked at when we wrote the state plan back in, you know, 16, 17, 17, 18, looking at the past three or four years of student performance and trying to project out what were the types of gains that we felt like were realistic to continue to push student performance up. Uh, now, I will say that was pre-pandemic. Um, so the state targets that we had for several of those years, we ended up um, securing a waiver through the U.S. Department of Education for. So for uh, the school years 19 and 20, we had state targets that we were uh, you know, going to meet. We've actually pushed all those targets out now for two years. Um, and we looked at the 19 school year and the 20 school year uh, as just sort of being steady in terms of student performance. Um, particularly because we didn't run the state assessment uh, in the 1920 school year. Representative Luna. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Thanks very much, Dr. Green. Um, going back to the um, to the academic standards, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how um, how the um, uh, the standards as as written are, I guess, informed by um, by other state statutes like um, like our recently passed Holocaust studies and um, and um, uh, concepts legislation. 
Sure. So we have a variety of different academic standards that are all posted on the website under the, the title of College and Career Ready Frameworks. So there are art standards, there are business education standards, um, I believe there are family and consumer science standards. Uh, but the three that have gone through sort of the really rigorous um, you know, public outreach and comment period and been adopted by the state board are the math, uh, ELA and reading, and science standards, because those are the ones that we're required to have as statewide uh, academic standards for the purposes of the state assessments. Um, so things like the Holocaust and genocide uh, standards live within the minimum standards. We don't necessarily have statewide academic standards that relate to that. One, I think because it's relatively new, uh, and two, because we don't have a state assessment. Um, and one of the things we have in New Hampshire as well is the state is required to adopt these academic standards for the purposes of having a test that assesses all students equally across the board. However, there's no requirement that school districts actually use the standards that are adopted by the State Board of Education. So, you know, we encourage them to because all of their students are going to be assessed on an assessment that is tied to those standards, but school districts are not required to adopt those standards locally. They could choose to adopt a different set of, of state or national standards if the local school board chose to. And a follow-up? Yes. Thanks. Um, and so, so going back to the example of the uh, Holocaust and genocide studies, um, you, you said that, that that feeds into the minimum standards as opposed to the academic standards. Um, and, and so uh, would, would the academic standards be then updated sometime to um, uh, maybe in the next round of updates for a, a certain curriculum area um, to include um, that subject matter? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And one of the key differences here is that anything that is enumerated within the minimum standards is a requirement of public schools. You have to do it. Um, it is a state regulation. But if it's in the academic standards, again, districts have the choice whether or not to use those academic standards to build their curriculum or not. So that's another key difference between minimum standards and academic standards. One is a choice and one is a state regulation. So the regulations around the Holocaust and genocide studies require districts to teach them and to include those components that are within it. We also have statewide social studies academic standards. And there are aspects of Holocaust and genocide content that is within the social studies standards. But districts would have a choice whether to use those standards or to adopt a different set of standards if they chose. So the, a proficiency score on a national test assessment indicates uh, proficiency in that competency. Does that correlate to our, our standards here in the state? Uh, so separate from our state assessment? Yes. Um, they should. So there, there are different studies. It depends on the exams that we're talking about. Um, so for example, we use at the 11th grade level the SAT for our juniors, for 11th graders. Um, and so they're being assessed on math, reading, and ELA through the SAT. We know that, for example, with the SAT, there's also comparability with the ACT. So students that are scoring a certain you know, level or score on the SAT for our state tests will most likely score a similar or comparable score on the ACT. So it, it really probably depends on the type of assessment um, and the test that's being given. We've done some comparability studies across subject areas. So for example, a student that scores a certain score on the math test, we know will likely score within a certain range on a science test because there's some comparability between math and science. There's a little bit less comparability, say, between English and science and English and math. So, um, so if I'm a high school administrator and I'm trying to set up the curriculum in that particular building with my staff and with my community, and we decide that at the freshman level that we're not going to be teaching this area of maybe U.S. history or whatever it might be, we're going to do that at the 10th grade. And yet we assess using a national instrument that may assume that you've had that U.S. history at the ninth grade. And so our proficiency may not look good, well, simply because we haven't taught it uh, yet. It's in the next year coming. Do we run in that alignment problem between our testing instruments and how the locals have decided to set up their curriculum? Because that is a local responsibility. 
so there's in one area where we have run into some alignment issues. Um, I think with math and ELA, we're good. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we part of the reason why we assess in the spring of the junior year is because much of what is on the test is being taught across the state in uh, ninth, tenth, and the first half of eleventh grade. So in in that respect, I think that assessment is a, a good assessment of where students are at. Um, However, with the science test for juniors, one of the things that we've noticed is our current science assessment assesses students across three different content areas, physical science, life science, and earth and space science. But in New Hampshire, the only two sciences that are required for graduation are life science and physical science. So earth and space science is not required for graduation. And there are some students that have not taken earth and space science. And there are questions about Earth and space science on the science tests that were given to them as juniors. So I think that we, if we really kind of dug deeper into that data, into those details, we would probably see differences in the science scores if we were able to look at students who have taken Earth and space science in high school and those students who have not. And my guess is there would be a disparity between those scores. Uh, we are currently working with our assessment vendor to do some changes to the alignment of our science test to make it more reflect the actual requirements on school districts. But that's more a result of state requirements and not necessarily, it, you know, any act that's, you know, a local school district, you know, is changing their curriculum. That really is just purely because of what we require as a state. Yes, Representative Luno. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. So I uh, wanted to uh, pick on what we were just talking about here a little bit. So earth and space science, uh, again, for, for, for example. So um, can, can you talk with us a little bit about school districts that do um, uh, uh, include uh, earth and space science in their, um, in their science curriculum? Uh, and uh, and maybe you know are, are are is that most districts or some districts or few districts, and in the end, how does that play out on um, on on our students' outcomes and what their uh, you know opportunities are for success? So this is one of those times where you you do have an overlap between the academic standards and the minimum standards, and you know with the science test how they both come into play. So all school districts offer earth and space science. Um, the minimum standards require districts to offer it. What they don't do is require students to take it. So as a student you have a choice. Mm -hmm. um, and so some students you know may take uh, physical science their freshman year, they may take biology their sophomore year, and then junior year they decide you know I really want to go into uh, the medical field. I'm going to take human anatomy and physiology. And maybe their you know, friend takes earth space science. When they go to take the science assessment their junior year, one of those students is going to have taken earth and space science and one has not. And so there's probably going to be a difference in the science scores for those two students purely because of student choice. Uh, you know, no part, so all districts are required to offer it by the minimum standards, but not every student is required to take it. Thank you. Um, there was a recent article put out. Um, and I'm reading from this, which was written this fall, New Hampshire students' test scores fell during the COVID pandemic. Um, according to 2022 assessments taken by sample students, 30% of the state's eighth graders and 40% of the fourth graders are proficient or above in mathematics. I've spoken with you a number of times regarding trying to track the cohort of students in all of our schools to find out how that particular class that's in the third grade and then later on another year fourth grade and tracking that and to determine and a little bit this goes a little bit to what Representative Luno was trying to say about the or stating that there may be some schools which are hitting it and others not is this one way we can determine that if we can get that cohort information back? I know we, we're we trying to get an, a, somebody to analyze that stuff for you, and I know that you're shallow in staff there. But, um, I, you know, I'm concerned that we're, we're doing something that we've got to look at and find out where our strengths are, why are they strong in certain locations, and maybe not in others. Is it a result of instructional staff is a result of aspiration of the community is it a result of supervision in the school leadership parent you know aspiration I, I don't know and yet we we need to get our math scores higher and I don't think it's necessarily just a result of the pandemic 
that we were sliding in mathematics prior to this. So I guess the question is, you know, will that cohort information help us understand where we need to really address some of our, our, our support from the legislature to help get that, you know, level increased higher in SARS to achievement? Yeah, so that's, you know, we're a big proponent of providing as much data as we can to school districts. Uh, you know, to your point, I think there could be a lot of reasons that live behind what the data says. You know, whether that is changes that need to be made in instruction and curriculum, whether it's a result of particular cohorts of students and the experiences and the environment that those students are in, um, whether it's you know, cultural shifts within school districts, changes in administration, we know all of that can impact overall school programs and data. So we're in the process or we're in the final stages of publishing a dashboard um, that will live within our website that's going to show that kind of cohort data. Uh, we sort of call them heat maps, but essentially you'll be able to see a table for each school that shows each of the grades and their proficiency percentages as they move through. So you'll see this class, you know, in third grade had this proficiency. Here's where that class was fourth grade the next year. Here's where they were fifth grade the next year, sixth grade. And you'll be able to see, you know, kind of a straight line, the proficiencies for cohorts of students as they've moved through grades. And we think that that's going to be data that's, you know, useful for schools and districts that are looking at trying to identify what, what are the issues. You know, maybe there's particular cohorts of students they want to focus on, or maybe there's particular grades. You know, we know, and not just in New Hampshire, um, but fifth grade and eighth grade, we tend to see larger changes in assessment scores, um, possibly as a result of students moving from one building to another building or coming to the end of uh, middle school. So there are different places where we know that if we have the data and we're seeing changes in assessment scores, whether they're going up or down, we'll know where to target specific resources for those students. I'm hoping by March those dashboards are going to be published, um, hopefully sooner. Uh, but I'm, I'm saying March, and then if I can over-deliver, I will. <laughs> the beginning of March or the end of March? <laughs> let's shoot for the beginning. <laughs> well, let's shoot for the beginning. That'd be great. Further questions of Dr. Green? Representative Myler? Thank you, Dr. Green, for being here. Uh, I'm aware that the 306 standards or are, are rules are currently being uh, reviewed. What's the status of that review? Sure. So there's a group that's been looking at the 306 standards and have uh, proposed some revisions to that. Um, we have met with a group of teachers. We've met with a couple of other stakeholder groups. Uh, we have several meetings coming up with some of the professional associations as well. Um, but right now, they're just recommendations and revisions to the standards. My understanding is sometime in either February or March, there will most likely be an initial proposal for the State Board. And at that point, it will become a State Board of Education process. Um, right now, I'm working with several of those groups to try to gather uh, input and feedback as to the types of revisions that they would want to see in those standards. Follow it, please. Yes. And so what's the procedure for the input from uh, the practitioners regarding those particular standards? So I know that the, the group that has been working on it is hoping to start scheduling some public meetings over the course of the next few weeks where they can generate public feedback as well as um, some specific meetings with some of the different professional associations like the superintendents associations, the principal association. Uh, we've met with some of the uh, curricula groups. Um, so I've had conversations with the Extended Learning Opportunity Network um, as well as the Library Media Specialists group. They've had some suggestions. Uh, school Counselors group has provided some suggestions. So we're continuing to seek public feedback, but I know that they want to hold uh, several meetings that are just going to be open to general public feedback as opposed to targeting specific groups. So will there be general feedback prior to the final finalization of those standards going before the board? State yes, board. yeah. And then once the state board takes up an initial proposal, there's always going to be you know public hearings involved with that as well. So there will be additional uh, public feedback and opportunities. My guess is that with something as, as large as the minimum standards, most likely there will be multiple opportunities for public feedback. Is there currently a draft that's available for review on the part of the public? Uh, I believe there's a draft that's going to be made available very shortly, yes. Thank you. So if I schedule a meeting for next month, would that draft be available by then? My guess is that draft will be available by the end of the week. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Further questions? Did you mean this, this week? This, yeah, this week. I, yeah. That's what I understand, this week. Yeah. 
So we're we're climbing up on it. That's yeah. that's uh, that's good. Rick, a qu yes. question for you. Yes. Could um, could you uh, get that? Um, get oh, that certainly. Copy? As soon as it becomes available, we're going to request that a copy be you know sent to us. We can make multiple copies here. Uh, but if, could you get a, a draft to this committee as soon as it's released? Absolutely. Yeah, yes. a PDF, and we can get it out yep, to this fine. as well as the whole yep, education yep, committee. Yep. That would be great. Oh, yes, definitely. Yeah, thank you, Rick. Definitely. I got another question. It's jumping off this topic a little bit. Um, there are a number of school districts out there that are giving their own assessments above and beyond the statewide assessment that which we do. And that that might be the... Um, key math test or some other test. Can you tell us the difference between a formative and a summative set, uh, test? That sure, yeah. They're, yeah. I know sometimes they're used interchangeably. They are very, very different. So I, folks like me within assessment circles, you know, really try to set those two things apart from each other. Because sometimes people try to equate the scores on one with the other, um, and they're used for very different purposes. Um, so the best analogy I can make when I was, you know, still in the classroom as a teacher, I would give regular quizzes to my students. We'd have weekly quizzes. And that was more for me as a teacher to make sure that the instruction that I was providing to my students was being received and that I was actually hitting the points that I needed to hit. So if I got a set of quizzes back from students and they didn't understand half of the stuff was on the quizzes, I knew the next three lessons I was going to give were going to be targeting that content that the students hadn't got. Uh, so formative assessment are like those weekly quizzes. It's designed to help a teacher in the moment change their instruction, change their practices in the classroom to make sure that they're filling gaps in student learning. Um, a summative assessment, on the other hand, is after the fact. It's designed to you know, show what a student was able to do after taking a particular course or a particular program. Um, and a good example in the classroom of something like a summative would be a final exam. If you get to the end of a school year and it's the last day of the year and a student takes a final, that's not going to inform the teacher's instruction. You're going into summer. That's really a measurement of how did the student do at the end of the instruction. So the state summative tests are summative assessments. They're designed to measure what a student was able to do by the end of a particular grade. So at the end of third grade, here's where students were at. At the end of eighth grade, here's where students were at. So many districts will use formative tools, um, things like NWEA, uh, STAR tests, iReady. Many of those tests they can give multiple times throughout the school year. And that really is designed to drive instructional changes during the year to make changes so that you can still uh, provide instructions to students before you get to the summative assessment. So if we have some schools that are giving the NIWA or NWEA or the the STAR, STAR math, STAR reading, etc., and but the the results on that uh, summative instrument, and some of those tests you can give mid year too as well, but and it's it's divergent than than the results we're getting from the statewide assessment, uh, and so a school district may be given a bad rap because here I have a slow achievement score here, but on our individual norm referenced assessment test, we're seeing are doing well because we better aligned it to our, our sequence of curricular instruction. Um, are, is that an occurrence that's common at all or existing in the state? Uh, yes. Uh, I regularly hear from districts that you know, have local assessments that they're providing that are you know, giving them one set of data, and then their students are taking the state assessment, they're getting a separate set of data, and they're saying, well, why are our students showing this level of proficiency here, but this level of proficiency here? Um, sometimes it's just a difference in, in the assessment structure. Oftentimes it's a difference in when the tests are given. Uh, and again, it's a difference in the, the purpose of the assessment itself. Thank you. Are there any further questions? We have a little bit more on the docket here, so I, I, I don't <laughs> want to. Um, not seeing it. Thank you very much, Dr. Green. Thank you. Appreciate it. And we're looking forward to the end of the week. <laughs> I'd like to, you know, I handed out a packet of materials here to all the folks here on the, on the committee here, and there may be a few people with packets out there. The next one down I had deals with the areas of assessment, specifically history, geography, civics, and economics, which there's a letter that um, I, I received from Mary Guile, who used to be the chairman of this committee that I've included in that packet. Um, I'm trying to locate it here. But it speaks to some of the requests. Here it is right here. 
Um, and this came from from Representative Guile. It's well, it's not a page. It's about halfway through, and you can see it. It was a letter written to Senator Stiles, and at that point in time, we had history and, and civics and economics as part of the required assessment given by the statewide assessment, but it wasn't being given. We were doing science and English language arts reading and mathematics. So then it was the decision of the legislature we, we put into statute that this now is responsibility of the locals to assess the nature of where they are with achievement in these subject areas. My question is, is that being done? And I'm not looking to the immigration test either as being an, an, an assessment of those areas of curriculum, be it economics or be it civics or being in history. Um, so, yeah. So um, I, 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 I throw that out there seeing that this was a concern that was generated way back in 2014. And I'd like to know whether if we have districts which have grabbed it and are doing it, or whether they're just leaving it up to the local classroom to do an assessment as we go along, just like the grade in your report card. So somewhere along the way, I, I'm, yet to, I'm guess asking committee members now, is this worth pursuing, or is this something that we just leave alone? Okay, the, the statute as it reads right now, I don't have it right in front of me, but the statute says the statewide improvement and assessment test, which we give, which is the statewide one, is for those areas of mathematics. Mm -hmm. Then we have the science at certain grade levels, and we have the English language arts reading. That's it. We used to have as requirement that social studies was part of that. However, we didn't have an instrument which was measuring social studies achievement. So we recognized that and said, well, maybe that's something the local ought to be doing. So we did say, but it's still a requirement. If you look at that area of, of I don't, maybe I. I it's in uh, on page six. On page six? Page six of uh, the C5. Toward the beginning. Yes, there it is. Okay, it reads, the statewide academic areas to be assessed shall include reading and language arts, mathematics, and science. History, geography, civics, and economics remain required critical areas of study. Therefore, assessment of these subjects remains within the purview of the local school board. The statewide assessment program shall only measure student understanding of key content, specific concepts, skills, and knowledge applied within or across academic content domains. And if you look back at 193E, those academic content areas include those subjects that now we, we handed over to the local school board to do. My question is, is it being done? Now we heard in the inaugural address of the governor the other day that civics is a, an area we want to pursue. Well, we should be. Um, so I, I'm just asking, okay, and that's what it's, I put it out there. Should we be trying to find out from school districts what they're doing in regard to this? So, Rick, I think that's a, I think that is a good question, and and I, I believe we heard last year or the year before or the year before that um, that the. Um, uh, in particular, I think the social studies curriculum is something that the department, the state, um, mm -hmm. um, uh, let me use the right term, Ac I guess academic standard for social mm -hmm. studies is, uh, is a work, um, uh, is a work in progress right, right now. And, um, and it, it, you know, maybe this is something that, that we could work with the um, school administrators association on to get uh, feedback from the districts on what their what each district is currently using for a um, social studies um, you know using that as the as the envelope for um, for this question what they're using for social studies curriculum given that the uh, that the state draft is um, mm -hmm. is still in progress 
would, would that be worth getting a poll on? I, I think it'd be, it'd be helpful if we, if we could use organizations such as that, or even right through the department. Yeah. Does the department have any information on, on what's going on? We, right. we, in 2014, we put it down to the locals. Now, okay, what's, what's going on? Uh, it's, it's something that I, as a parent, and I, as a legislator up in my neck of the woods, I have people asking me, you know, what's being taught in school and social studies now? They want to know that their child knows that Brazil is in South America. New Mexico is not another state, a country. And, and, and th those are terms which used to be in the old National Council for Geographic Education stuff that came out. They had an assessment which was used for that. I, that was, that's a long time ago. That's back in the 1980s. So what's being used today? I don't know. Well. Representative Cornell. Other than the, the testing, I don't think we even know in what's being taught in each grade. I, I think even in the middle schools in Manchester, if I can remember, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, 8th grade was always U.S. history, but 6th and 7th taught different things at different times and different cultures. And, you know, one might have South America and then they do Mexico in the, the next grade. So it's we don't even know that. No, it's it's changed. We used to use the old textbook models where you start out with community, my my family, my neighborhood, my community, and then by fourth grade you're usually in a state history, state geography, and then you move on to U.S. I don't know what's going on nowadays, and um, I think it's worthy worthwhile to try and, and ask that question. Yes. I, I think I think it's worth pursuing. The question is, is can you get the data? <laughs> That's the question. Uh, I mean, it's always the question. Well, I mean, yeah. trying to, uh, as we have found, I mean, in the uh, teacher shortage uh, work study uh, work group, uh, we it, it was even hard for superintendents to get data back on what the status of that was. And so, I think the the uh, school districts are inundated with requests to get information, and so it's hard to get that information back. Perhaps it might even might be easier to use the social studies teachers on this particular topic, ask that group if they could get the information from their peers rather than going through the, through the school district. So I don't know. I mean, just the gathering of the data is difficult. I, I agree, Representative Myler. There is a social studies group within the state. We could always work with them as well. I'm open to trying to work with any group that can provide us more information. There was a study at the department going on, but that was disbanded. Yeah. So now we are sort of this area of flux on this subject area. And we're, what we're going to do, we're going to end up waiting for the national to do something. And then uh, lo and behold, here we are once again developing our curriculum around some kind of a national proficiency level, not what we see as necessary in our own state. So. I'd like to pursue that and try to get as much as we can. Right, um, Rick. Uh, qu question. Question to you. Do you do we know where the um, where the, um, the department is in terms of uh, development of the social studies curriculum? I, I think it's been disbanded. That's just oh, that's that, that's what I thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it is not. There's nothing going on. Oh, okay. I didn't realize that. Thank you. So we need to. If you give me the green light, I will start doing some questioning and asking and get back to this group. Mm -hmm. you feel about it? Okay, give me the green light. Okay, there's one other thing I'd like to do here. I know that it's, it's 11 o'clock, and this one is probably going to take a little bit more time. Uh, item number four, there was a New Hampshire, New Hampshire State Task Force on Mathematics Instruction. They issued a report back in January 18th, 2012. That report was chaired by Paul Leather, who was the Deputy Commissioner of Education underneath Jenny Berry at that time. And this report was a very thorough, comprehensive report from which we have taken some recommendations. And we've gone and, and, and placed them in the statute, one of which was to get involved with uh, applying our skills through STEM and CTE programs. We've done that. The fourth year of mathematics, we didn't go with the fourth year of required math course. We went with the fourth year of having math skills embedded in a course in the high school, of which had to be approved by the local school board and every student has to take at least four years of mathematics, 
or three years of math courses and the one year of embedded mathematics. Question I have, is that being done? It goes back to that accountability thing again. And if we could all open up to that report right here, I'd like to walk through it. And I've starred several areas which I think are, are critical and very informative. That was back done in 2012. We're looking at our state proficiency in math is going the wrong direction right now. And for what reason? I don't know. And, and, uh, but we do see it in the news. We see it and we hear it. We saw it. It's, some are saying it's all pandemic related. But according to this report, it was going on prior to that uh, back in 2012. So on page five of that report, I've underlined and this is coming out of 2014. It states, New Hampshire must reverse the disturbing trend of poor mathematics performance in its high schools and minimize the need for remediation at post-secondary institutions. Jumping on here to the next page, I underlined on page 6. However, the data in figure 1 also suggests the decline in mathematical performance becomes evident during the middle grades, sixth through eighth grade. That's where that, this task force started seeing the fall off. Going on to page seven. When 11th grade mathematics performance is compared to other content areas, there's further data to suggest that performances in mathematics, the middle and secondary levels need to become a priority for New Hampshire. For all grades tested by NECAP at that time, mathematics performance is lower when compared to achievement in reading. That still exists. While the percentages of students proficient in reading seem to remain consistent during grades six through eight, this is not the case in mathematics. That was back in 2014. Jumping further to some of the areas that I've underlined, on page 11, the presentation further stated that approximately 65% of students entering New Hampshire's community colleges in the fall of 2009 tested not ready for the first college level mathematics course. It seems this data could have been predicted based on the 2009 NECAP and NAEP results, which demonstrated that approximately one third of grades, grade 11 and 12 students were, profic were proficient in mathematics. I talked with the community college system the other day. We still have remediation going on at the community college level. I don't know if it's that 60% level. They're not teaching as remedial math now. They're working with the kids in the classroom. And of course, they cater to an adult population that's older than the student coming out of, out of uh, high school. Moving on, let me read these things off, and then we can have a little bit of a discussion on it. Uh, going to page... Uh, 16, the final component of instructional, of instructional change is the impact teacher content, the impact teacher content and pedagogical knowledge and attitudes about mathematics have on student learning and achievement. Teachers need a deep understanding of mathematics they, te they teach, including concepts, practices, principles, representations, and applications to support effective instruction. That's an old study. But it's surely true today, too, that even our teachers in elementary school have to take the practices in terms of mathematics. And some balk against doing that, but I think it's absolutely you know, a good case for having to take that. Uh, page 17, based on research relating to effective teaching of mathematics, the task force to improve mathematics instruction recommends pre-service mathematics teacher programs and professional development for practicing mathematic educators. I think it should be for all teachers, uh, elementary through middle and on high school. Are we doing it? I don't know. Um, recommendation five, include training on how to effectively utilize and incorporate 21st century skills such as STEM and CT outcomes in mathematics instruction to provide students with opportunities to apply mathematical understanding in authentic contexts with real world applications. That was the onset of the math learning community program and using the Accuplacer at the end of the 10th grade, which we no longer fund and it's not being done. 
Uh, and what we also recognize that there's different styles of learning and different styles of teaching. And this is proposing that we, we teach it in conjunction with the skills that career is going to be requesting them to do later on. Um, going further here, there's a, on page 23, you can look at all the recommendations which came out. Some are just great recommendations. On page 23, in addition, high school mathematics curriculum instruction often focus on mastery of conceptual and procedural knowledge rather than on the application of concepts and procedures linked to real world context. How true. And going a little farther and then we can have if there's any need for a discussion here. On page 24, underline, the goal should be to provide support so that all students can reach the college and career ready line by the end of the 11th grade, ending their high school career with one of several high quality mathematical courses that allow students the opportunity to deepen their understanding of the college and career ready standards. That's why we integrated the embedded mathematics in the fourth year. Recommendation 17 there on that same page, include a study of mathematics for each year that a student is enrolled in high school for a minimum of four credits in mathematics for graduation from high school. That we didn't do. That we didn't do. It's three. We went with the embedded, which is a, a, a maybe a credit in social studies and learning how to use the spreadsheet. Number 20, on page 25, Provide increased opportunities for deeper learning, including experiences to apply mathematics in real world contexts. Connections will be made to extended learning opportunities. We had a youngster in the other day with an extending learning opportunity that came from your town there, Representative Luno. Um, opportunities utilize science, technology, engineering, career technical education, and relevant applications. And lastly, recommendation 20 include the requirement of successful completion of algebra for high school graduation. However, future movement will be made to ensure that all New Hampshire school students are obtaining mathematical content equivalent through Algebra 2 to be prepared for a variety of college and career opportunities. We know that that is not the case, that there's a number of students coming out of Algebra 1 who are you know, just unable to tackle Algebra 2. And uh, so that was one of the things we were trying to do with the course that Beth Dorian from the community college system was trying to work with us on. So mathematics is sliding still. Um, what are we going to do? Or do we do anything or do that we let all that federal money in the schools take care of it? Representative Cardelli. Thank you. I, I think it's not just a New Hampshire problem, but according to NAEP, um, it seemed to be a, a national problem uh, for mathematics. Um, uh, so I don't know um, uh, if there's a nat, uh, national solution um, or a local solution, um, but it's interesting that a number of these recommendations all, all uh, reference um, re real world application of mathematics as part of the rep, uh, recommendation. Um, um, so I'm not I'm not sure in your answer to your question where we go, yeah. but I, I think there are several uh, pieces of legislation dealing with math, mathematics this year that uh, will provide uh, for a good discussion of um, uh, where we do go. I think I mentioned at the last meeting I had a, a meeting with all the math teachers up at Rippendale. That's an interstate government uh, district we have between Orford and Fairleigh, Vermont. It's one of our districts, and I. Had, high school, middle school there, and elementary, there was not one tune sung. They were all sort of like going in different directions in terms of how I teach mathematics and based upon their background, but they're all very anxious to see their, their kids get to the point where we're seeing that level of achievement we want and working cooperatively together. Is there a mathematics association in the state? that we could work with in terms of trying to... Is anybody out here maybe know Becky, do you know? Yeah. 
So it, they're just not siloing it to middle school, but are they also working with the elementary? A lot of kids get the fear of mathematics right in the grade school. And from that point onwards, it's, it's very difficult for them to really grasp, and especially if the, if the teaching style doesn't match up with the learning style of that child. Okay. Yes, Representative Luno. Yeah, Rick, thanks for including this because I hadn't seen this report, the leather report. That was before. very comprehensive. This and after that, he left for Kentucky. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, and obviously some of the, uh, the you know, the data is um, is a decade old, but I think the um, the, the the issues that, that it raises are, um, are, are certainly, uh, you know, contemporary. Um, but, but one of the, the the thing that one of the things you skipped over in here, and I think your review on this was excellent. On page nine, figure four has got me going here um, because it's the cohort map. Yeah, and and it's it's interesting because um, it uh, it it certainly tells the story about about you know something's happening in the um, in the. Uh, early high school years, where um, where where you you, you know the um, the uh, kneecap scores in in this case sort of fall off a cliff, but in the years building up, taking a look at the cohort that moves through, and you sort of have to look at it, I think, along a diagonal going across the the cohort map. In general, the scores are improving. They just they just fall as 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 a as as the cohort goes into the more advanced grades, but across the years they um, they increase. That's how I'm reading this. Is that that's that's how it is right across our country, and and you know I had it when I was a school administrator and principal up in Alaska. We we saw the fall start. Yeah. At the end of the junior high school, and 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 then it went downhill. Um, so, what can we do to try to reverse that trend? And so yeah, we, yeah. Well, it, it, I I think it's an there's an interesting dynamic if I'm reading this 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 graph um, correctly because looking at the uh, 2010 eleventh um, uh, uh, grade did better than the 2009 11th grade, and they did better than the 2008 11th grade, and they did better than the 2007 11th grade. So there was improvement horizontally, but there was decline looking at the cohort as they moved through the grades. So th there was this sort of like general improvement going on, but, it, but we were losing something in that in that sort of nine, ten, leading to eleven, for for every cohort. And see, and we have so many other issues approaching us now that weren't existing back at in this era. It'd be great to get some and, new and, data and, on And uh, you know, the social issues, the pandemic yeah. related, yeah, to yeah. all that. Uh, families, you know, you know, they probably don't have dinner together. They have it around the TV set or while they're doing Xbox. And and um, I'm 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 concerned here, and I look forward to the data we might get back from Dr. Green here on following these cohorts in these subject areas, and even getting down into the weeds, not just mathematics, but getting down into the skill sets and the knowledge in mathematics, so we can see that you know it, it's it's expensive to replace your whole curriculum in a school district. When in fact you may just have one set of elements or themes which are needing repair, repair that, not throw the whole thing out with the with the wash. Uh, Representative Cornell. Thank and you. Then, and then Senator Asari. How how do these scores compare with how the students are doing in their classes or, or you know on their, you know, There's could some it, of the assessments. Yeah, I you know is there a are they doing this poorly in their their high school math classes, or are they just doing this poorly on the tests, the kneecap tests? Uh, 
It, it, it could be, that's a know, good question. As you get older in school, attitude toward standardized testing falls off, I think, from when you're younger and a classroom teacher has the group of kids and says, okay, everybody's going to be on time and you're going to do well. And, you know, and, but in high school, they're doing it as a big group. And I don't know if it's given the same way. Representative or, Cordell, do you think there's any, the other day I was talking with my wife and I was saying about a couple of our grandkids, which are off at college and graduated and some going. And I said, boy, you know, when I was in college, getting an, an 88 in, in something was a, real feat. Now the kids come back and, you know, I've got A's, you know, and so my 88, was that an A back then to, compared to today? Do grades, are grades easier today than the, inflation. yeah, great inflation, I don't know what you want to call it, but uh, when I went in as a school administrator or principal up in Alaska, I looked at the report cards after two, after the first semester, I collected them all, and this is a school of in elementary. So it was it is basically grades four through six, and I had about 450 kids in that school. <clears throat> collected the report cards, and the average grade in the school was A minus. I said this can't be, and so when I had a teacher meeting, I said that to the staff, and I said, "What's going on here?" And I said, "Well, the parents are kind of expecting this, and are you going to be there to support us when we give what?" I said, yes, you just sent them to me. We changed it so a C was a C. And by the end of the next year, at the same time, things have been corrected. And, and actually, everybody's more pleased, parent-wise, knowing their child was here and it wasn't a false report. So that, I'm not saying that's characteristic of education today everywhere, but that occurred where I was. So great inflation. Representative Senator. What I've heard many times is that to like math is it, it's a very esoteric kind of thing. And only the very smartest can go with math. And I think this particularly something that has been told to women, oh you not mm. you know, a woman is not that the math is not for you. It's for certain other kinds of people. And I think teaching math has had that with it. If you have an expectation that the kids are not going to understand it and they get that feeling, they're not going to be terribly excited about it. I think math is fun. It's, it could be done in so many different ways of seeing how math is in every single thing that you do. You see math problems, you don't think of it as a math problem, but it is. So you have to know a certain level of math in order to understand, in order to function. So I think math has had a bad rap, and I, think, I like to see it promoted. <laughs> Representative Luno? Yeah, thanks. I, I couldn't agree with Senator Ward more on, on this. Um, and I, I had heard this at, at some NCSL um, um, uh, work groups. I, I think I heard it when I was on the school board, too, um, that uh, that that certain groups in our society were discouraged from from pursuing math. It's not for you, and and I think we see that in a lot of areas, and it's and it's why it's so important to begin and and address that. And I, I know this is a hot word, but it's an equity issue. And in with what with what Senator Ward was saying, it was an equity issue for. I'll use the word girls because we're talking about you know. Um, you know, elementary and, and secondary school, um, and uh, where, where you know, everybody is taking math, and I'm, again, I'm sort of looking at this figure four, they're all taking, everybody's taking math in third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, and then, you know, something happens, and, um, and, and uh, uh, you know, certain, certain groups are discouraged from uh, or encouraged to pursue something else, and not math, mm -hmm. and um, uh, and then you wind up with the uh, with the number at the bottom in grade eleven, um, which uh, which I think reflects that that um, um, you know that shift, and uh, and I, I think as a as a as a state and as a country, uh, you know we can do a lot better when it comes to making sure that uh, that 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 all of our all of our students 
have um, have you know strong opportunities to pursue and succeed in not just math but other you know areas too. And um, and uh, anyway, I'll I'll leave it at that. But I think I thank Senator Ward for uh, for raising this. Representative Meyer, I see you turn you. Well, yeah, <clears throat> I think, Mr. Chair, you've got your answer. We need to pursue this. Okay, I, I think we, we will we will pursue it. Um, talking to one of my grandkids who's a freshman in high school this year, and he was saying, "I just don't want to be in that art class. Sign me up for a science or a math class." He. His brain, there's brain research out there now that uh, we need to be looking at. Uh, he, he was saying, I can do well on that, but I, I don't get this other side. And I have another one that's up at St. Lawrence University in the same domain. It's his forte is statistics and, and all the spreadsheets and, and business. When it came to have to know something about the Sistine Chapel, he didn't want to know a thing about it. Uh, and unfortunately, that's not kind of a narrow focus. And I think some people are, are we, we've got to recognize everybody has that ability. It's just we've got to connect with the right button there. And we can't have the expectation that we had when my wife was going to college. She was told by her father, you can either become a nurse or you can go off and be a PE teacher. <laughs> her brother, electrical engineer. And, and so... Margaret wasn't given that option, and I would say she's the gifted one in the family too, and and certainly the best looking one. But uh, I I I think that we got us you know. I as a kid was fearful of certain things in school, at a element spelling. I hated it, and you know to the point where I got myself sick several times over having to be called on by the teacher, and there are a lot of kids like that fear. And and uh, of making a mistake, mm -hmm. so so I think it's a lot to do with the instruction too, not just the curriculum side, but the instruction side and the the nature of the individual and a lot of issues. I I, I agree with both of you on, on this. I, I actually think that has something to do with what you underlined on page twenty five, connecting it to extended learning opportunities. I, your 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 grandson who wants art, if he could realize how the art could be connected, how math connects to art, mm -hmm. it might make him want to learn it more because it does, mm -hmm. you know, spatial relations and and all of that. So that has something to do. Maybe that has something to do with. How he'll learn it if if he can if he can realize that math does affect his art classes. Yeah, I think what we need to do we need to pursue this subject of mathematics and work with some math teachers and and various organizations trying to get some reporting back to us to find out how can we as a legislature help out on this, um, and not pointing any fingers or anything like that, but just we all recognize we are at a point where we've got to do something in the state. And so I'd like to maybe use this group as a group where we can start chewing at it. Any further, Becky, I see you have a handout in the audience. Oh, good. Thank you. Okay, that I think takes us down to, we've done pretty much everything on that docket today. Yeah. Uh, I, I just want to comment uh, particularly on the item five dealing with the, Ed 306. Okay. <clears throat> I was uh, encouraged uh, from Dr. Green's uh, comments on this has been a very controversial issue. And there's been um, all kinds of charges of um, no lack of transparency, et cetera. But based upon Dr. Green's comments this morning, it appears that there is an attempt to expand the input for that. Uh, which is all the um, various stakeholder groups are asking for. So it appears to me that prior to any kind of a final report going to the, uh, the State Board of Education, that those, uh, not only the advocate groups being involved, but also engaging community groups in seeking input on that too. So I was I was really pleased to hear that. Well, because I think that's that, not what I've been hearing. I, I agree with you. I, I think that there's mm -hmm. got to be transparency. There's got to be communication between all groups. Mm -hmm. And when I see the word like competency, and when I saw that initial report came out and that word was being challenged, um, acknowledgement of something uh, uh, something such as that, um, it, 
that that's a lot of statutory changes that are going on here and and uh, a lot of changes which are going to impact everything we do in education in the state if if we can make changes which are positive and going to result in the positive i'm, I'm all for it but let's do it in a that you know like 21 n says where we have to do it in an open shared way working with all parties including students parents school board members teachers principals community community leaders all have to be involved with this um yes representative luno yeah th thanks rick i i completely agree with that and and what 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 mel just um just said um said as well uh that i think um um Dr. Green was uh, was was very helpful in in saying that uh, that the uh, that dr a draft uh, set of rules would be available uh, by the end of the week. We can get that out and begin the the comment period. But I think where I do have a concern, and I, I hope you know this would be shared with with the members in the committee as well, that that um, um, you know it's not going to be 45 days from Friday that. Um, that the department plans to take those draft rules to the State Board of Education. And I don't know how in 45 days they're going to be able to convene the, um, the public feedback groups um, as well as, um, as get um, feedback from, from this committee uh, relative to the, um, the draft rules and then be able to incorporate that feedback and do all that and do all that in time to uh, to present in early march to the uh, to the state board so so you know i would i would you know respectfully suggest that maybe the department reconsider its uh, its time frame in um, in bringing these rules to um, uh, to the board to uh, provide uh, uh, public stakeholders as well as this committee uh, I think um, a reasonable amount of time uh, obviously in consideration of you know, we're we're not just all sitting on our hands waiting for this report to drop. We've got a few other things to do, right, Rick? Yes, we do. And and, uh, and uh, yeah. uh, you know, before bringing it to the state board, I, I I think that might be a reasonable request from from this committee. I was very impressed with uh, Nate Green, Dr. Green. I've met with him three times or so within the last month over there at DOE. He's very open wanting to work with us and he's underneath the auspices of Caitlin Davis who expressed the same desire so I I I, I I'm, I'm just going to wait and see what kind of process they present I think they've gotten the message that we're going to have to all be part of this and uh, nobody's going to take anything you know thrown at us it's got to be able to stick and and um, yeah. so just a couple, I, I, I remain hopeful. Yeah, just a, a couple of comments on that. <clears throat> you mentioned earlier uh, in your comments around students. I do hope that they're seeking student input. And the reason why I say that, uh, I think students bring to the table a much different perspective to their learning styles and needs than what we give them credit for. Um, I, if you look at the availability of information that that's there now they have that information you know they 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 have their that information right here right and so the question is is how do you translate the information they can get here versus a learning style within schools yeah and i think it's a heck of a challenge to try to do that so i hope that they will seek student input the other thing i think it's important to know too that any changes that come out of the State Board of Education has to come back to this committee. The Legislative Oversight Committee looks at all that stuff that's going to be dealt with at the State Board of Education. So I think the issue of the inclusive approach to getting the data, to getting the information there before it becomes finalized, before it goes before the Rules Committee, and I think that's very important, that that input is there before the Rules Committee, because once it gets to the Rules Committee, it's awfully hard to change. It's just not input from us. It's our recommendation. Right, exactly. Yeah. And so that, that, that's a real concern. And I agree with you on that. Junior high kids, I, I just have to get my junior high grandson down to help me pair this thing to my car. 
Um, <laughs> it's a new one, and it's pairing to the old one, and I sit there just frustrated coming down the highway wanting to talk to somebody and can't do it. So that younger generation is a good generation, but I'd also talk to the kids that are in the community college system and, and, and those that have just recently graduated to find out what was their experience like while they were in the grade school through the 12th grade in terms of mathematics. And that feedback is good feedback. Anything further today? I know that Senator Ward has to get out of here. She has another meeting coming up. Um, is there any comments from the public? Yeah, we're, I'm open to that. Um, we're going to adjourn here in a minute, but if there, what we're seeing now is that we're, we want to get a hold of the cohort information. We want to get the, uh, the, the report that's coming back from the contracted service for looking at our assessment tests in terms of improvement and following individual classes all the way through. We're interested in looking at this, this very much in the area of social studies and finding out what's going on at the local level. And we're also wanting to delve into the area of mathematics and, and maybe using this uh, math task force report with some of those wonderful recommendations. There's over 20 some odd recommendations in that. I don't think we should leave it alone, even though there's a lot new research out there, there's good stuff there for us to look at. So those are the three takeaways I can take from this meeting right now. And also waiting for that big report to come in that we're all waiting for in terms of the, the minimum standards for public school approval. That's very important. Um, so with that, anything from the public? Not seeing any hands flying. Everybody wants lunch. Thank you very much all for attending today and the next meeting will be, we'll call the chair. Okay. Yeah. Well, if, if we do it, it's going to have to be on like, um, let's see, today's a Tuesday, right? Right. Oh, that's right. So we'd have to be after. OK, we'd have to talk to those folks, too. Um, I, I think it'd be great for us to have uh, uh, if we can get a regular schedule going. Um, I'll, I'll talk with everybody here on the web and find out what days are good. Um, we know that we saw at least 16 bills of which have been withdrawn LSRs for this committee. So we may be down to around 100 now. And, and that's still overload. Uh, and so we're going to have to, and I, I got to find out which ones have fiscal notes because they're going to be the first ones out and that's going to take some time hearing and executing sessions. So I'm going to try to stay away from Mondays like I told the committee so people have doctor's appointments, et cetera. You can do that. Um, what day does the education committee meet, Senator Ward? Tuesday morning. Tuesday morning. Yeah. So there's there's another time too that as bills start leaving here and bills coming we are in both places at the same time so we have to work on that as well so i'll get back to everybody and try and find a day so yes i i don't want this to you know they say we should be meeting at least quarterly i think we need to meet more than quarterly i think we need to be meeting and getting on these topics here and not let them hang and, and then disappear when we disappear stay on it any further? Thank you very much. Have a good one. Yep. Thank you.